Uh, welcome everyone. Just a quick note to let you know that we'll be getting started at 3.05 p.m. Eastern, 12.05 p.m. Pacific. We'll just wait for a few more people to join before we get started. Thanks. All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. First off, uh, thank everyone for joining us for today's Inside CanWNT webinar session, which is the third in a series of five webinars that uh, are being delivered through July 1st. And we, uh, we certainly start by saying we hope everyone out there is, is well and staying safe. Uh, my name is Dominic Martin. Uh, I'm the Director of Marketing at Canada Soccer, and I'm going to share a few uh, initial information uh, for everyone before we get started. Um, as many of you will certainly have heard us mention already, uh, this webinar series is a continuation of our Canada Soccer Nation Inside initiative, uh, which we've launched as part of, a, a part of our continuing effort uh, to support the Canadian soccer community as we all collectively go through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for more information on the available uh, resources and information connected to this campaign can all be found at canadasoccer.com. So continuing in their role as hosts uh, for the Inside CanWNT series are former women's national team stars Rian Wilkinson, who is currently Canada's women's national team assistant coach, as well as youth national team coach, and Robin Gale, who currently Canada Soccer's Excel mental and cultural manager. We do have uh, an excellent lineup of panelists uh, set to contribute for uh, today's session, uh, which is Playground to Podium. And uh, I will, uh, Rian and, and Robin will introduce them in more detail a little bit shortly. Uh, but we do sincerely thank uh, all of our participants for making the time to participate today. Uh, as a quick refresher on the question and answer format, uh, we do encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the webinar uh, using the Q&A tool in Zoom. Uh, questions will be selected to be answered throughout the session. Uh, and uh, there will be a, a further Q&A session at the end of each section. Uh, I will note that we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible, time permitting, um, but some questions may be forwarded to future webinars, um, so please stay tuned for all of those. Uh, to optimize your experience during the Zoom session, we do recommend uh, you select either side-by-side -side view or gallery view uh, from within Zoom, uh, if this is available to you, uh, as this should help ensure that you'll be able to see all of our panelists while viewing the content that's being shared at the same time. Finally, as we do like to always mention, uh, we are working with technology. So if for any reason we lose connectivity uh, during the webinar, we do encourage you to stay inside the Zoom uh, webinar and uh, we'll collectively do our best to, to relaunch and reconnect as quickly as possible. So just bear with us, but we are hopeful that we won't have any issues today. Uh, okay, that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Rian and Robin to get things underway. So thank you everyone and enjoy. Thanks, Tom. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining Rain and I this week for our third edition of Inside Canada UNT. Every other Wednesday, we've been giving you an inside look into different elements of our program, 
We started our first webinar hearing from some of our players, Alicia Chapman, Kadisha Buchanan, and Diana Matheson. And two weeks ago, we were joined by head coach Kenneth Heiner Muller. If you've missed either of those webinars, you can still check them out on Canada Soccer YouTube channel. And it's really some cool insights from both the players and Kenneth. So if you're a player, a coach, or a fan, there's really something there for everyone. Today, as Don mentioned, we're really excited to have some new staff members and players to join us to look at the pathway to getting to the Canadian women's national team. Thanks, Robin. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to officially introduce you to my boss, Danny Worthington, who oversees everything to do with the Canadian youth from U15 to U23, and is also an assistant coach for the senior team. Also here is Brandon Frith, who runs Ontario Rex and is the Youth Excel Program Manager with Danny. Uh, most importantly though, and no offense to you two, I'd like to introduce you to Julia Grosso, midfielder for the Canadian national team, and Jade Riviere, who's a fullback for the Canadian national team. So welcome to all of you and look forward to hearing from you. Just as a heads up, we've structured today's webinar slightly differently. We'll be working in two parts, as Dom kind of alluded to. We'll start with Brandon, who will take us through the details of the Rex program, followed by a Q&A for Brandon and Jade, or sorry, a Q&A for Brandon and Julia around their experiences and involvement in the Rex program. Then we'll hand off to Danny to learn about the acceleration program, what exactly that is, and some of the deliberate work that's being done to prepare our younger athletes to perform at the senior level. And we'll end everything with a Q&A for Danny and Jade. So as you're listening to Brandon and then Danny's presentation, Send your questions through the chat and Reen and I will raise them at the designated periods. So let's get started. The first thing we always want to do is start with our people. Brandon, the first thing I want to address with you is Reen's been trying to convince me that your last name is pronounced Firth. Um, and looking at the spelling here, it would suggest otherwise. So before we kick off, could you just confirm how should we be pronouncing your last name? Uh, I think you're right. It is Frith, not Firth. Um, haven't met that guy, but uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on, Robin. Um, yeah, no problem. We just wanted to make sure we had the right person. Um, but now that we've kind of cleared that up, can you tell us a little bit more about your soccer journey and your pathway to being the Ontario Rex manager? Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess where it all started, uh, I was in university. Um, and uh, at that point, I kind of moved away from the game. Uh, and I kind of really wanted to get back into it. So uh, I wouldn't say I necessarily volunteered, but I kind of got recruited back into coaching at a club level, uh, which was great, uh, getting back involved. And, and that's kind of where I got back to really loving being in the game. Uh, and I was support, surrounded with uh, some great mentors uh, and, and great people who kind of helped guide me through. Um, and and kind of through coaching in university and, and going through uh, opportunities opened up where I got to go also work in a university level with uh, UOIT um, where I learned a lot there and again gained more mentors to continually grow myself um, and then through that process I got to uh, got an opportunity to go in with work with Ontario soccer um, and uh, started as, a, as an intern and then moved into the coaching development which was great and again how else can you really grow yourself by surrounding yourself with good people and having the manager of coach education for Ontario to kind of mentor you and guide you, which was phenomenal. And then I met Brian Rosenfeld and uh, had a pleasure first meeting with him uh, and an opportunity opened up to work with him and his team uh, with the high performance group, uh, which was unbelievable. And um, at that point, uh, yeah, we did Canada games. We got provincials, got to work with uh, within the OPDL, um, got to learn a lot from, coaches within the league, but also uh, the high performance group. And then from there, uh, Joey Lombardi started up the, uh, the regional Excel program and uh, with, with that team and you were a part of it, Robin. And yeah, I got to go in there and be mentored by everyone in there. And again, great learning opportunities. And uh, yeah, from there, it's, uh, I got to join with the program in uh, September, 2018 and the rest of history. Hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that, Brandon. Um, even for me knowing you a little bit, there's some new tidbits for me in there. Um, so now that we know some more about you and a bit of your background, uh, we're excited to hand off to you and hear about our rec system and what it is that you do. Awesome. Thanks, Robin. Uh, just to start off, I just want to say thank you for everyone for taking the time to be a part of this webinar. Um, thank you to the coaches, the parents, but most importantly, the, uh, the players for taking the time. 
Um, to start off, we're going to start off with, with a video, I Feel Fitting, uh, Christine St. Clair, 185. I uh, hope you enjoy it, and we'll go from there. in the wall, it is over, brilliant, what a strike, Christine Sinclair sends a gasp around the Olympian, that video uh gets me every time it's uh it's truly amazing the top goal scorer in the world is canadian and i don't see it uh any better fitting to to name our, our youth initiative or our youth goal to be more st Clair's more often and what we mean by that is really i believe uh developing more world-class players more often because the word that comes to mind when i think of christine st Clair is world-class and, and when, we, when we take that, it's, it could also be developing more Excel players uh, to professional environments. And the three objectives that really outline that goal uh, are these. And I'm going to take you through the first two. And then uh, Daniel Worthington is going to come in and, and take you through the third one, the acceleration group. But if I'm really going to simplify it down, it's about finding the right players. And, and as Canada Soccer, we're committed to working with technical leads within each province. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're working in their regions to find the best players. And if the best players aren't necessarily in those centers, it's uh, hopefully this presentation allows you to understand the pathway to get those right players in. And it's us working together as a nation to make sure we have the right players in those centers. And then from there, we have to build the right environment, a safe, fun, and, and challenging environment to push the players in a best and best and uh, best and best environment. And then, using the right curriculum and a varied curriculum to stretch them uh, by growing in their, in, their, in their locker with tools or it could be uh, becoming better problem solvers. And then if they're able to do that at a national Excel level, it's finding the right time to really challenge them and stretch them to see if they could fully really fulfill their potential and hopefully represent Canada at the international stage with the, the senior women's national team because we're really working on focusing in goal two, more Sinclair's more often, on the next generation of players. How can we best prepare the players we have now for 2024 Olympics? And if they're not ready, then that's okay, because players have time and we can get them ready for the 2028, but really how can we best prepare players uh, for the future? Now, taking you through the Women's Excel Player Pathway, um, there's many, many different layers and a lot of people ask, like, how do I get to the national team? So I hope this provides more clarity. Uh, within Talent Perform, there's really three sectors if I could break it down. And, and one would be talent identification events that provinces run. Another one would be for those provinces that are able to run provincial programming. Um, and then the third would be standard, standard-based leagues or player development program. And, Jason DeVos and his team have put a, an amount of amount of work. Uh, they're doing a great job to, to uh, build a competitive structure for standard-based leagues across the country through club licensing. And, and to simplify it down, it's working with clubs and club administrators to uh, deploy standards within, within their um, organizations. 
And some of you, based on the province you live in, may already be in those, uh, those environments, which is great. And then from there, we have regional Excel centers. So those players identified within these environments can move into regional Excel centers based on the province you're in. And I'm, I'm going to encourage you to look forward uh, in your province to find your talented pathway and how you can get into regional Excel. And uh, like I said, we're working with te technical leads and you can find that your pathway based on uh, your province website. And you can find the website information on the Canada Soccer website at the top with all of our, uh, all of our members. And then we'll dive deeper into the regional Excel super centers. And within those, within those centers, really what they are is the epicenters for our national programming. The core players are gonna come from there to make up the national Excel teams. And then based on your consistent performances uh, within uh, national Excel environments and the, the show for um, large potential, you may be nominated and selected for an acceleration program. And as I said earlier, uh, Danny Worthington is going to take you through more detail into that. And with being an acceleration player, you're given the affordances to parachute in and out of women's national team programs for experience and, and really to stretch yourself. Um, but, but truly, like I said earlier, uh, it's about getting more acceleration, more Excel players into pro environments. And if you could think back to the first webinar that was done, um, Alicia Chapman, for example, um, went through a professional avenue to get into the women's national team at the age of 25. So pathways are all different. Um, but I think a, a great example that we have on the line, a, a, linear a linear pathway through our pathway would be uh, Julia Grosso. So I'm going to pass it on to Robin uh, to take us through Julia's pathway. Go ahead. Great. Thanks for that overview, Brandon. So before we get into some more of the details of the RECS programming, as Brandon just mentioned, we're going to hear from Julia, who graduated from the BC RECS program two years ago, or almost two years ago now. So Jules, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm really keen and I think the people listening are keen to hear about your experiences as a player in the BC RECS. So my first question for you is, how old were you when you started and how did the RECS environment differ from your club experiences? Well, thank you for having me. That's a great picture on the right. Um, well, when I started, I was, I believe, 13 years old with the U15 team. Um, but yeah, so I started when I was 13. So the first thing I did was with the U15, we went to the U15 call cap tournament and we ended up winning that. So that was like my first ever um, thing with the national team, um, with the youth national team. And then um, with that, like after that, uh, that's when like BC Rex kind of started. So I got like scouted from my HPL team. I played for Mountain United, which led me into BC Rex. And from BC Rex, that's when I would start getting called into the U17 national team and then the U20 national team and um, then onwards from there. But yeah, my experience with the BC Rex was awesome. Like it was really cool and it was a great experience because like all the players that were there was like the best from BC, which was really cool and an honor to play with. And it was awesome to have like the opportunity to play with the girls from BC Rex and some of them um, also going with, to meet with me to the youth national team. So having those friends as well. And um, yeah, but it's just really cool to be playing with them because um, they have like, they're also like, they're really, really good players to um, like I have the honor to play with. And um so they like really pushed me and trained me to um, get ready for the next level kind of thing. So it was really cool. And, but yeah, so from there uh, with the national team, it was like the U17 national team and then with the senior team. So it was a really cool process and uh, BC Rex definitely helped push me um, get to where I wanted to be. So. In what ways would you say that BC Rex helped to push you to where, to where you are now? Um, I think it was just like the coaches, honestly, and it was really cool because I know like some of the national team coaches would come in and help out a lot. So I think they like really pushed me like they knew my weaknesses and my strengths. We always would in meetings would talk about like what I want to work on, like my strengths and how I can improve my strengths. And so on the field, like they would really, really focus on that and they would like do drills to help to help me and to continue further my development. So I think um, the coaches like had a huge, huge role in my development. And um, like some days, you know, they would push me really, really hard, but I really appreciate it. And it's all worth it in the end. So, um, so I think it was like the coaches really helped with my development. Yeah, great. So just to be a little bit uh, specific in terms of what you're experiencing now, 
Um, you know, you just finished your second year of university at the University of Texas. You've already earned 21 caps with the senior national team. Um, if you think about your time in the rec system from the time you were 13, uh, which is amazing, um, how did that help prepare you for when you went into university and when you eventually joined the senior national team? Yeah, so I believe like Rex, they just, I guess you could say like it really helped just like mature me and just like being with those people. And also like we had to like move schools to um, Burnaby Central. So like I was like, that was like kind of like a different kind of thing for me because I was so used to like being near my home kind of thing. So I think it really helped just like mature me and um, being with like a players that um, are very like mature and very good at soccer and have like like a lot of goals like the same goals as you do really really helped me um with that and like everyone has the same like they want to either they want to go professionally or they want to go to uh, soccer in the states or Canada we all kind of had the same goals and dreams which is like fun and like was really nice to know because then you just can push each other and help achieve your dreams with each other so I think that was a really big part of it. Yeah, well, thanks, Jules. We'll, we'll pause you for now until we get some more Q&As, but it's, it's great to hear how that personalization in the rec systems, as well as, you know, that alignment with teammates who have the same purpose and goals as you, how that really helped to develop you and get you ready for where you are now. So we're going to continue with Brandon to dive into some of the layers of recs in the Super Rex program. Awesome. Thank you, Julia, for, uh, for coming on and sharing your story. I think there's a lot players can take away. I'd be curious what your takeaways are from, uh, from Julia's story. But uh, looking here, this is, the, this is the playing population in 2019 of female youth players uh, across our country. And we're committed uh, to, to finding the best talent because we know there's a lot of talent out there. Uh, and we're really um, looking to, again, align our systems um, whether it be from club to regional excel or regional excel to uh, national excel to make sure we get the right players in front of the right coaches to uh, to maximize and strengthen our system now looking at our regional excel centers uh, these are where our, our current regional excel centers are across the country and really what we're doing within those centers is we're really committed to continually educating and growing both players and coaches and equipping, equipping uh, players with the tools they need to become the best players they can be, but also I think most importantly, the best people they can be. Uh, a big commitment to growing people. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in more information on regional Excel, there is information on the Canada soccer website. They could look deeper into, um, into, uh, what a regional Excel center offers. And as I said earlier, uh, within the talented pathway, um, really the pieces of the puzzle uh, to be brought into a, a regional Excel center. Some provinces have one, uh, some provinces are all offered able to, some offer all three. Um, so the talent ID, the provincial programs and the standard based leagues. And again, I, I encourage you to look further and, and get curious of what your possible pathway could be to get into a regional Excel center. But if you find yourselves within one of those three or two or three based on the province you live in, um, you are being considered for a regional Excel center um, and, and your, your chances go up for being offered an invitation to come in to a regional Excel center. And if you are selected, um, your journey just begins with Canada soccer and the Women's Excel program, which is quite exciting. And I think uh, a great case study that we can use is, is Annika Leslie. And, and Annika is a, a Nova Scotia native. Um, she grew up playing club soccer there and, and went through the Talent ID system and the provincial program of Nova Scotia and, and was filtered into the Regional Excel Center. And, and based on uh, her performances, um, we offered her the opportunity to, to come into uh, the Ontario Rec Center and migrate into the Super Center. Uh, and she's done really well. And just to, uh, to highlight, she, she actually captained the U-17 national team in their, their last series in Mexico in, in November. So I have a little interview for you of, of Annika. I uh, hope you enjoy it. I think there's a lot of lessons you could take away. I'd be curious, again, uh, what are some takeaways you could take from her interview? Um, it all started on so five or six my parents um signed me up for soccer and uh my first team was sponsored by i think frank shell a gas station 
on the South Shore of Nova Scotia. I was sort of in the club system for a number of years until I want to say like age 12. And then I got um, called for my first Rex tryout straight from club. I didn't have a provincial uniform or anything. And I was, <laughs> I arrived there all ready to go in my like club <laughs> jersey. And I was in way over my head. It was such a stressful week. I was not ready for it. And I didn't make the team that year. I was shocked. No, not next year. I was not shocked. I um, I did make provincial that year though, and I went I went with that. And the following year, that was my first year with Rex. I think I was I would have been thirteen at that point. So I played with Nova Scotia Rex for I guess it was three years before, um, and also with the provincial team at the same time um, until. Cindy Ty, she brought me aside one day and told me that I was being considered for the the roster for the under 15 women's CONCACAF. That, I was honestly like really shocked. Like I didn't, it wasn't something that like happened very often. I feel like it wasn't something that it was like an expectation or something that you knew that once you were 15, you were at the age to do that. We had um, Tenny and Sydney Kennedy go, but it wasn't sort of in like the culture of Rex to do that. That changed a lot of things for me. That was so exciting. I mean, I remember getting there and we walked through like that, just the cafeteria and all the like country's flags were like lined up. That was pretty exciting. I, um, yeah. I, I started watching those games recently, actually, the ones at CONCACAF, and I, it's so, it's actually, it's gratifying to see how far I've come since the games. I feel like at the time, it was like a big challenge for me, like that tournament really like tested me, but it's nice to see how far I've come since then. Yes, my first Rex coach was um, Grand Chandler, and, you know, I loved him. He made my Rex experience so positive. So when he left to start a new program, I was, um, I was devastated. But after that, we brought in you know, Julia Burton, Nino, Cindy Ty was in for a period of time. I got to work with um, Matt Holton and Mike Wyatt. I just, I think I've had the privilege to work with so many amazing coaches and I look back on my experience with each one of them and they've each brought something different to my learning. I just think I've had the really, really positive experience to be able to work with each of these coaches. I think about this a lot and you know, I thought because I'd been in Nova Scotia for so long and I'd known the girls for so long, I just wouldn't ever, like, get to the point of comfort on the team that I was with the Nova Scotia Rex. But honestly, like, I feel, like, right at home um, at the Ontario Rex now. Like, as I, I've said, I think I've mentioned before that I feel just really comfortable with the team. I can talk to really anybody on the team There's without that, like, it, it would be difficult to to move away so that like socially like I yeah um and that's great and then um soccer I, it's it was the right move for me I I felt ready for the change of pace and I think it's a really good environment you know we prepare for camp specifically for camp it's something that I didn't do before where I'm I'm actually playing every day with the girls that are eligible to make the squad. So, you know, there's a bit of, there's like good competitiveness there, knowing that there are people that can take your spot and you never know who's going to go. So as much as it is nice to train with them, like it gives you a little bit of, you know, there's someone right behind you who could be coming in for your spot as well. So it's a, just a, um, a competitive environment. Yeah, I think that was a great video, a bright future ahead for that uh, 
great young lady and um, hope, hopefully there's a few pieces of gold you're able to take from it. Um, so moving on to our, our regional Excel super centers. Now, as I said earlier, they, they really are the, the epicenters for the, uh, for the uh, youth national teams. Um, the, the core of the players are going to come from these three centers. And our three centers are located in uh, British Columbia, Ontario, and, and, and Quebec. And, and really within these centers, we're, we're really committed to continuing to educate both players and staff. Uh, continuing to give them both tools. Um, and within this best and best environment from U U15 to U18, um, we're able to, to target this development age where we could drip in uh, different methodology to grow, their, grow them both technically uh, with, with their skill set, but also um, stretch them in problem solving that they could face in, in an international competition. Um, different ways to target the individual within the collective. And then as Annika mentioned, uh, simulate uh, competitions like CONCACAF preparation, what we were doing with the 17 before COVID hit, they were gonna leave two weeks or, uh, or three weeks before. Um, but, but really our, our X factor within the regional Excel super centers is, uh, there's, a, there's a few, but we get 44 weeks. Like, we get 44 weeks to work with the players. It's, it's really, um, the super centers are next and, and we get to work with the players every day for 44 weeks. We're able to offer them a uh, periodized competition. We're able to offer them um, enhanced uh, exposure to um, international competition. Uh, we get to really invest in the person um, and help prepare them for whether it be youth teams, whether it be university and, and hopefully, cause I know there's a lot of them have dreams to go professional, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, and, and, and to be honest with you, uh, from a personal side, I'm, I'm extremely uh, grateful and, and privileged to be able to work in one of these three centers. Um, not just because I get to work with, with the players, which is an absolute pleasure, but also get uh, the pleasure to work with a great staff in Ontario. Um, who are extremely supportive and push the program further. And we're fortunate that uh, everyone gets to be involved in a national Excel environment. We also get the opportunity to collaborate with, uh, with some great centers with uh, Rudy and Julie in, in uh, Quebec and Amy and, and Chris in, uh, in BC and, and strengthen and align. So we're able to uh, bounce ideas off each other and really invest and develop all the players across the country, not just solely in our silo of Ontario or, or BC or Quebec or, or other provinces. Um, so yeah, so just with that, I just wanna say thank you for, uh, for listening and I'll pass it over to Rian. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. It's it's always interesting to look at the slides and look at how much work and development is being put into it. The linear versus the non-linear pathways is super interesting. You know, we've got Julia here and Jade who've come through a pathway. They've sort of hit markers. Um, you know, Robin's online here who was also a superstar youth who made all the national teams. Um, as someone who did not make a youth national team in our first webinar, we heard from Alicia Chapman and from Diana Matheson, all players who played for Canada and didn't have that clear pathway. You know, Chappie came through the youth teams and then got cut. I didn't make youth teams, D didn't. Everyone's got their own path. So can you make it almost more tangible for us? If you were a young person growing up in a small town in a province like Saskatchewan, what might your journey actually look like? No, that's a good point, Rian. I, I think um, if we're going to take, let's say, uh, Yorkton, for, uh, Yorkton, Saskatchewan, uh, a town city out there, and, and uh, if I'm a 10-year-old and I'm playing for Yorkton FC, like how do I get in to a regional Excel center there? So uh, based on this system uh, within Saskatchewan, it would be through, uh, through their scouting network, but it would also be through uh, technical director recommendation um, or the, the technical leads reaching out to the TD. Um, they would come see uh, the player within their training environment at the age of 12, 13 to identify. And based on how you perform in your, uh, your, your team environment, um, you have the opportunity to possibly receive an invite to go into the regional Excel center out there. And after a few trials, you may be offered the opportunity to come in full time. 
Well, great. Thanks for that overview, Brandon. It's really great that you can provide some practical and real examples of how it all works and, and how we aim to make it all come together. Um, we're going to open now for a couple of questions for both Brandon and Jade from, or Julia from the audience. Uh, so Brandon, I'm going to start with you since you've been on a roll. Uh, one question we've had, which is specific to the Ontario, uh, province of Ontario, obviously, is do players that um, do players have to come through an OPDL club in order to, to make it into the Ontario Rex program? It's a great question. So, um, no, they don't. So, uh, simple, no, they don't. Uh, so, the way it works is they have all three uh, pieces of that formula that I talked about. So, the standard base league would be uh, the OPDL. Um, that would be the league that they play in. They also have talent ID events. What would be, Ontario calls it, um, talent on location. So players are recommended in by technical directors or club coaches. Um, and I actually attend those events as well to, uh, to monitor with uh, the provincial staff and, and other OPDL coaches. Um, and then they actually bring those identified at talent on location and OPDL together in November, what they call the provincial screening competition, uh, which again, I'm there as well. And we're monitoring players. And then from there, uh, they roughly invite in about a hundred players per age group and gender, uh, they narrow it down to about 60 and they go into the provincial program. And then a member of the Ontario Rex is always at, at least one is always at the events and we go all the way through and then we get to scout the, the comp competition in, uh, in April against uh, Quebec. Okay, and thanks Brandon. We had another question from Daniel, who's the coach in New Brunswick and he was just wondering, what is the best way for coaches? And you've identified some ways that players can be identified, um, but w within working the realities of your club system, like what are some things that you would recommend coaches can do to help support their players with whether it's getting on the Rex pathway or maybe supporting them if they have to take a nonlinear pathway? Yeah, for sure. I think that's great. So I think uh, if we're looking at that way, uh, you have Marty Herdman and you have, uh, you have Eunice out there that are two great resources that you could tap into. Um, to gain more ideas of how they could grow their players. I think a bit of it is also getting curious and watching games and, and what do you see from, from top players and the, the two ladies on the call here are great examples of players you could look at and try to idolize um, and how do you add that to your game um, and then just encourage them. Like I think a big thing is instilling confidence and encouraging them to push to the top level and if they don't get into a Rex or a next environment they could always go into a college university and, and then hopefully pro and then into the women's team. So you never really know. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Jules, we're going to move into two questions from the audience for you. Um, so I'm going to combine two from Corinne, I hope I said your name right, and Anthony. So they were curious about what challenges you face so far in your soccer journey and, and then how do you stay motive to, uh, motivated to, to overcome those challenges? Um, I think one of my, uh, one of my biggest challenges was probably just, I remember with the national team, um, I got a really bad concussion and that was a really, really hard challenge for me just because like when it's your head, it's like really unpredictable when you're going to come back and it's like a long journey. And I remember we were playing, uh, Germany and I couldn't, um, play in that game and they like told me I couldn't, wasn't a part of it because of my head, obviously. And it like took me probably like six months to like fully recover. So I feel like that was definitely one of the biggest challenges and getting back into playing soccer like you you're kind of scared to have the ball like stuff like that but I uh, overcame it and everything was good but that was probably like one of my biggest challenges growing up well what's your tips then you said you overcame it um yeah your wisdom with the crowd um I think it was just the support from like for example like Sarah Smith our physiotherapist like just people like them like to help me overcome it like they would constantly check up on me and they would like motivate me to um always like you know just keep trying keep pushing and um I eventually just did and and I you just can't be afraid or scared of that like you just have to you know just like work hard and keep going you can't um let that affect you from like your like soccer so that's what I just did yeah amazing so that individual will plus a great support system uh my last question for you um kind of you know a little bit what we were just talking about but knowing what you know now what advice would you have for, for young players starting out on their journey? Um, I would probably just say like, keep going and keep pushing. Like 
even if you, for example, don't make one team or you don't make the other, like just keep going and like, don't get down on yourself because everyone has different pathways and it's not always the same. You don't always have to be like, you need to make every single one of like, you know, like just keep pushing, like keep working hard every single day. And also like, it's not really what you do in front of like coaches and stuff, like keep working hard behind the scenes and like do things on your own because that's ultimately what's going to push you and get you to where you want to be. It's what you do behind the scenes and don't, don't be down yourself if you don't make, certain teams that you wanted to make like that just that should motivate you to um, keep going because once again everyone has their own pathways oh thank thanks a lot julia and uh both you and brandon thank you for the introduction to to rex we're now going to be moving on to sort of the second part of our programming where jo jade will be joining us and, and brandon more officially um you know, Jade is another player who's come through our systems, now part of our acceleration program, and Danny will be talking more about what that actually is. But uh, before we talk to J Jade, we're going to be speaking uh, to Danny, um, Danny Worthington. So I, I've called him my puffy coat wearing shorts guru, <laughs> the, the fashion icon of the senior national team. Um, I'd really like you to explain how a Nova Scotian has an accent like yours um, uh, before we get started, Danny. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Hang on. First of all, I just want to thank you for uh, sharing my fashion sense with everybody around the country. Um, you know, I like to stay warm, um, so that's great. Uh, yeah, great question, Ryan. Um, I've been here 21 years and it feels like yesterday. Um, just from a, a small, small town called Romarsh. It's in Rotherham, South Yorkshire, England. And I found my way to Canada in 1999. And it's interesting working in the system and working with some abnormal people and players is that my coaching pathway is actually been playground to podium. And I started my career here in Nova Scotia uh 2003 2004 uh club level worked up to the province exactly the pathway of the players and, and worked with some great people uh, mike hudson graham uh, graham chandler cindy ty and then as i started to develop as a coach i started looking for mentors and, and my first real mentor would have been a person called lewis page who it was a big part of the Canadian women's program over the last couple of decades. And working with him, he kind of introduced me to some national coaches, uh, including Brian. And, and really, my, my, first, my first introduction to international coaching was on the men's under-17 boys with a, with a guy called Sean Fleming. And from there, from there, I did a good job. And, and I think a piece of advice for anyone as you're moving up the ladder is, is, is just increase your range. So whether that's scouting, whether that's presentation to players, individual sessions, and I did everything I could. And then one day, John Herdman believed in me enough to move me to Vancouver and become part of this team. And as he moved on to the men's program, uh, you know, I work now with Kenneth, a uh, different kind of leader and, and help contribute and, and grow the women's game in this country. I do want to say something because I missed it. I was kind of automatic there a little bit. When I do things like this, it's important that you're, on, you're listening to the team behind the team. And, and I just want to share with every presentation I do, I just want to thank my wife, really. My wife's name's Victoria. And I've got three lovely kids and they're my team behind behind the team so without them i couldn't do what i do and i wouldn't be passionate about growing people and keeping them curious to grow daily so yeah that's me nice thanks danny so uh, yeah like the three little kids so if, if we hear any screaming in the background uh it's probably victoria actually at the kids <laughs> <laughs> oh, th thanks you know we've just heard about the rex pathway from brandon and now we're gonna hear from you about the acceleration um programs that we run as someone who played a major part in developing players like Jordan Heidema, like Deanne Rose, can you tell us a little bit more about the program and the process of graduating our youth players onto the senior team? Yeah, for sure. I think the first and foremost is understanding what an acceleration player is. 
and, and really that's the most promising player that we would call in an amateur environment that's tracking towards the women's national team, not just technically and tactically, but globally, like with the mental skills, uh, with the, the soccer science and physical skills. So that would be an acceleration player. Um, but simply, simply an acceleration program is our X factor. It's been an X factor for Rio and, and hopefully an X factor for Tokyo. Uh, it's really about accelerating the most promising players to the women's national team. That's it. Simple words. And I think the, the other side of it is one thing you've seen since 2012 to now. If you're good enough, you're actually old enough. Um, and I'd like to take you on a little journey, if that's okay. So what, I, what I've got here, just to start the presentation, really, is I've got a, a movie. And before, you, before I play it, I just want to ask you the question, because there's going to be some aspiring young ladies out there and, and some coaches, too. And this is the Rio, Rio 2016 bronze medal game. And, and really, I just, just want to ask you the question. When you're watching it, or you're watching it for the first time, or you're really living it, what excites you the most about what you see? So we'll play it from there. still can't believe that was four years ago. Um, so when you're thinking about what excites you the most, I'm going to share what excites me the most there. And it's the young players having an impact in one of the biggest games for our team. It's the old players integrating with them, you know, providing the performance and knocking off the host nation in the Rio Olympics to, to secure that bronze medal. That excites me the most. But more importantly, like, the second goal there, like Jesse Fleming pressing with intent to win the ball to deny players, then being able to create one or two yards for herself to be free. Deanne Rose just finding herself a gap and, and working in behind the line and receiving that. And then like having the confidence just to twist turn and then Christine Sinclair just arriving at the right time to take a touch and finish in such a fashion. So that excites me the most. Um, yeah. To take it moving forward, forward from there, I just want to show you the acceleration by numbers. So if, if, I, if I look at what we worked with in, in 2013 to 2016, this is it. And when you look at that, things stand out, like the identification process, 32 players to 11 to six consistently starting. You know, when we, when we born or when this program was born, it was born because the program wasn't set up to, to, to progress past the, the London Olympics with an aging team, potential retirements. So we had to go out there and, and look for players and discover new talent and work with individuals across the way. The other, the other way I look at this is look at Ashley Lawrence and 
she's having a great career at the minute at PSG and she's turning out to be you know, a player that can play multiple position, positions and have a big impact. And she's playing against Marta here. And in some senses, it's kind of the old to the new and passing the torch. And in truth, the acceleration program is just making sure that the players are arriving at the right time. And this is it. So when, you, when we look to celebrate the players that have come through, and there's more, these are some of the standout players. that have kind of come through the program. And some of you won't know this, like you, you look at Janine Becky and, and her pathway, non-linear, uh, a dual citizen from America, brought in at the under 20 next level, then accelerated and, and didn't, didn't make the, the uh, World Cup squad in 2015 and had to work hard to earn minutes in a Pan American Games team against full national teams. And at the Rio Olympics was the quickest female goal scorer. She held it for like two days, or the quickest goal in history, and she held it for two days until Neymar Jr. Take it, took it off her. But uh, she's come well, and she's having a great, great season or seasons at Manchester City. And then Diane Rose, too, like the youngest ever goal scorer. Some of you may not know she wasn't a part of the program. She was in, then she was out. What did that do to her? Did it make her more resilient? Did it make her want it even more? I remember in, I think it was November, November 2015, we had an under 17 camp and we brought her along. And within 15 minutes of the senior national team staff watching her, 15 minutes, we put a name on a ticket to go to Natal in Brazil to play a Four Nations tournament against Brazil and Mexico. And she went from not being in the program to being ready right now uh, to play for Canada against Mexico. And, and the rest is history with her. I think the important piece here is, is that was the old program. That was the last quad. So what next? Like, how did we have to change for this one, 2017 to 2020? And that was great. There's some great discussions internally. And yeah, I just want to show you a few of the strategies uh, that we came up with to make sure that we could sustain podium success. So the first strategy, and, and this, came, this came really um, out of a couple of things, is, is professional first. So when you study, when you study the world's best teams or the top four. Most have professional leagues. Most of their top youth players go into the professional game early. Um, so it was important for us to try and find a viable path for our young, most promising players that may want to bypass college and go straight to the pros. And when you look at this, at like Jordan Heitema, proud of what she's done really. Um, really proud two way two reasons why i'm proud one she's had the courage and bravery to move at the age of, of 18 away from her family to one of the biggest teams in europe playing in the champions league and fighting and competing for a spot earning minutes every day against the best players and playing alongside our own ashley lawrence every day and I think the other, the other thing I'm proud about is that her progress since she's moved to a professional environment. You can only do so much in a Super Rex. You, you continue to grow in, in the NCAA at, at, at a certain level. But everyone, when we speak to staff and, and players around her in, in everyday training, the ability to finish working in, around the box She's just taken a game to another level. And I'm proud of that. Um, proud of that and proud of her. I just want to take you through a quick journey though. So this all started in 2017. So 2017, we sat down as a group. So the head of sports science, the head of uh, sports medicine, the head coach, John, at the time, 
myself as the director of the program. Robin Gale, who's on the line, is the athlete life planner. We all sat down and divide, and Alex Odgin's the mental trainer, key piece. We all sat down and we devised a deliberate four to six year, what we call the gold medal project to help her on a journey. So I'm proud of that framework. And if you look at it, as she progressed through the 2018, she went with you, Rian. She went with you and captain your squad. And, and I show everyone when I travel the country that there's not too many players that could have scored that goal against Germany. And she did. So what kind of learnings did she have? And I know she's important for you, scoring across all three levels. 2019, she signed a professional contract, had an experience at a World Cup. And then 2020, arguably scored the, the biggest goal that, she, that we could have scored as a team. And uh, if, if you chat with her and you, you, you speak around the staff, and you, all you have to do is look at her face when she scored the goal. She nearly missed it twice. And, and then she scored. And then it's the celebration. First person there, Christine Sinclair. Yeah, so that's Jordan. So I'm, I'm excited about her future and excited about where she can take it, as I am excited about the All Acceleration players. And with that, I just want to segue into this piece here because she's on the line. And Jade Riviere. Uh, so I've got to know Jade a little bit over the last while and um, as a person, as a human. And when you look, look at Jade, her, her pathway was, was pretty linear in the sense that she went through the Super Rex system, but she had to move to BC and she had to move back to Ontario. She secured, she, she secured um, an NCAA program in Michigan and she's just had a great World Cup in 2019. But this strategy is basically called individual with accuracy. Um, and I know Robin's on the line and, and the two key principles around working with Jade would be one, making sure she's available at the right time. So there's nothing here to show you, but Robin does a great job with Jade and Jade does a great job managing the people that she has to manage in Michigan to actually make sure she's available for the women's national team for each event so we can maximize her growth. And I think the other, the other piece here I just want to show as you're watching it or you're seeing it, is the competition at the right time. So really, we started to invest more with Jade after a World Cup experience. And I don't know if you'd have asked Jade at the beginning of 2019 whether she'd have been on the women's national team and playing at the World Cup. I don't know whether she'd have said yes. I think she'd have believed she could, but I don't know. Um, but coming out of the World Cup, I mean, three what we would call gold medal standard uh, games, which is positional profiles and objective measures that we decided to actually invest more energy into helping her grow and then really working with Jade on, on her ownership to grow. Um, so that's the competition at the right time. There's little things that you add, like when we go to Michigan, we actually go in and fly in and we work with that, that, that group of staff from their egg coach all the way down to the physiotherapists, their mental trainers. And, and we package a complementary program. So the collaboration is key, but more so is the ownership and the leadership of Jade shows with inside that, 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 uh, that system. So I've spoken a bit about Jordan and I've spoken a bit about Jade. There's more players. And, and the other strategy is the succession. It's with the right players at the right time, the succession of young players to underpin podium success for the future. So as you know, Rain's, Rain's on the line. She's, she's the under 17 and under 20 coach. So a lot of assessments happen after tournaments, so recently after the under-20 CONCACAF, lined up after the, or after the World Cup under-17s, we talked about players, measured players, identified players. And we've got a pool of players, more than that's on here, 
we have a pool of players that we continually to monitor and track through the NCAA or their domestic environment. But ultimately, I just wanted to share these players with you because the three on the left are in an NCAA environment. The two on the right are in the Ontario Super Rex. And when we talk about acceleration or, or the, this kind of, these kind of strategies, the X factor, the X factor with the three on the left is that we get to work with them consistently inside the women's national team. And, we, and they get access to all the practitioners from Kennet all the way down. The ones on the right, we have to, the, through the aligned Excel and Super Rec system, we, we're committed to working with coaches, staff, uh, practitioners that may get into the national youth teams to actually help these. And ultimately, the, the, the biggest thing that these, these work on is what we call an individual performance plan which is highly tailored, but more importantly, driven by their strengths and their goals to continue to push forward to the women's national team. And lucky enough, we, we got here, Olivia Smith, youngest ever player for Canada. She made a debut in, in, in a tournament in China and looking forward to continue to monitor her growth with you, with you Brandon, but more importantly, inside your program, Rian, with the under 17s. And I wanted to share this here, this with you, just this slide, because I'm sure there's, there's, there's many young players that may not be in the system, may be in the system. And if they're in the system, we're looking. And if they're not in the system, how can you get in the system? when we start talking about next generation or the, the 2024-2028, who can these be? Like, who can they be? And hopefully when, when, when I show this next video, that you're inspired because Jordan, Jade, and these people that you see here, Julia, Gabby, Jade Rose, Olivia, and more. They're just starting their journey. And that's what excites me the most, is how much they can improve. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to play this video here. And while you're watching it, I want you to think about your path. What is your path? What can your path be? And how do you choose to take that opportunity? Yeah.
And I just want to leave this with the, the final message. Is this picture here. I love this picture. But before I end on to Robin, I just want to just say, go, if you're good enough, you're old enough. And that's what the acceleration program really is all about. If you're good enough, you're old enough. So Robin. Thanks, Danny. Uh, looking at that video, you know, the pathways changed quite a bit since I've come through the system. We won't mention how many years that's been. Um, but it's incredible to see, you know, to know the work that's going on behind the scenes um, to support these players, to help develop them and to really help them excel, hopefully at the senior national team or in professional environments or in an NCAA or a Canadian university environment. So thank you to yourself, uh, Brandon, Rian, and, you know, I know there's a massive team behind this team as well that put a lot of work in to, to prepare our youth players. Um, so Jade, you've been waiting patiently. We're going to get you involved now. Um, We've ended on this picture of you here with some of your Ontario Rex teammates at BMO Field after your first match representing the women's national team on Canadian soil. Can you tell us a little bit about this moment? Like, what did it mean to you? What do you think it meant to some of your Rex teammates seeing you representing Canada at the senior level? Yeah, so um, that picture, I love that picture. Um, I love the video as well. So thanks, Danny, for that. Um, that moment was awesome. I mean, like, just to see their faces, like, they have huge smiles on their faces, and I have the exact same smile on mine. Um, just to see them at the game and, you know, supporting someone who kind of was in their shoes and, and went through the Rex program, I think is really cool. Um, that was definitely a moment that I will remember, um, seeing them, you know, from going from training with them in Rex to, to being on the big stage representing my country and still have that support from them. I think that's huge. Um, I think that they just wanted nothing but the best for me during that game and for them to come out, you know, with big signs, like had my name written out in some big Bristol boards. I think that's just awesome. And I'll definitely remember that moment. Yeah, that's great. And it, it's really a testament, I think, to what we're doing in the recs that they're able to develop this community with the players that, you know, they're supporting their teammate. And this is, you know, this is a win, not just for Jade, not just for them, but for everyone. Um, so Jade, you talked about, you know, your teammates and coming through the recs. What, what has that been like, you know, going through the Ontario rec system and now playing with the senior national team? Um, I mean, it all happened really quickly, if I can be honest about that. I was fortunate enough to play with both the Vancouver Rex and Ontario Rex, which I think is really cool because I get to see the perspective of two different provinces and to see how two Super Rexes are, are really fit for um, young players to go through. Um, I mean, I would say that like playing with the national team, obviously that's a huge goal a huge dream since I was a little girl um to be able to come from you know a small town pickering to be able to play for a national team um till this day I mean I'm still like speechless about it uh I don't think that I will ever be able to find words to to you know mimic that feeling um but I definitely have to say that it's definitely because of the two different provinces that I got to be a part of at a young age that really opened up me as a player, being an individual, being more independent, I think that really helped me kind of go from being just like a young girl from high school, going to like playing with um, girls who are much older, much more experienced professional players. I think that uh, I definitely have to say kudos to those two um, programs for helping me get through that. Thanks, Jaden. Well, I'm sure they'll be happy to hear that feedback. No, we are. Uh, <laughs> my final question for you before I hand over to Reed for some audience questions is, you know, behind the scenes, I know and I see you balancing being a student athlete at Michigan and you had to do it when you were in high school as well. Um, and you're doing that while representing Canada on the senior level. And sometimes that can mean an absence from 10 days to 30 plus days in a very short period of time. How does the, the women's national team um, or the acceleration program that Danny was speaking to help support you as you strive to excel both at school and both with the women's national team? Yeah, so um, the biggest challenge that I'd say that I kind of go through is obviously balancing academics and athletics. I think you can ask a whole bunch of girls that go, or student athletes that go through that. I think that's probably the biggest challenge um, for me, definitely, like you had said, um, leaving school for like 
it can be like a month, two months. Um, I think that has been a hard thing to overcome. Um, I think though, having the support of the national team and the members, the staff members on the national team has definitely helped me. Um, like Danny said kind of earlier, like tactic wise, he like flew with me to Michigan. Like he flew down with me. He sat down one-on-one -on -one with me and my coach and we kind of went over things that, um, that he would teach me at the national level and made sure that my coach was on the same page with it. So he was always supporting through there. Um, medical wise and like sports med wise, um, our sports scientists and athletic therapists, they're always in contact with my staff. Um, they're always making sure that I'm good, I'm injury free and I'm ready whenever they need me. Um, and mental wise, I mean, you Robin and Alex, you guys always picking my brain about something. You guys are always checking in and making sure that I'm good, you know, balancing my school and my soccer and that everything is good so that when I go to the national team, I'm level-headed and I'm ready to, to be a part of that environment. Cool. Um, thanks, Jay. That's, that's really, you've said two things that are really interesting. And, and the first one, you said you played for Ontario and uh, BC Rex. What was it like making the decision to move to BC? You're your only child, you're from Pickering. Um, what was it like, how did you make that decision? What was it like for you guys as a family to have you move across the country? Um, I mean, I'd hope my parents were a little sad about me leaving, but I mean, I'd hope so because I'm the only child, but uh, we definitely made that move because for me specifically, like I knew I was gonna miss my family, I knew I was gonna miss my friends, and you know, it have to, it's kind of like changing a whole new lifestyle. I'd start school there, you know, meet a whole bunch of new girls, have to kind of go through that process about making new friends and like being on a team and stuff like that. But I think the biggest thing that got me through that is kind of knowing the reason why I was doing the move. And for me, it's because I wanted to accelerate my level of play. I knew at the time I couldn't get that in Ontario because we didn't have an Ontario Rex, unfortunately. So I knew the next, the next best thing was for me to go elsewhere. And I mean, it, it helped me get to where I am now. Obviously it was upsetting at the time, you know, having to move when I was 16. But I, like I said before, it helped me be more independent and if, if anything, and helped me get through, you know, the challenges of playing with the national team, being in college alone, those things were like, very minimum compared to the move to BC. Cool. Oh, thanks. You, you also talked, and, and this is a bit to, to Danny, there have been questions like, what do you look for in a player? And what are the scouts looking for? Jay just said that you came with her to Michigan. How many acceleration players are you working with at a time? Because I know Canada soccer has an unlimited budget, but it definitely sounds like mm -hmm. this maybe isn't something that every single player gets. No, no. Um, when you look at it, we visited various NCAA programs from Dean Rose to Julia's um, to Jesse Fleming's um, to, to, to Jade's. The way we did it four years ago is everything was via relationship on, on conference call and, and more tracking and monitoring games. We've just been fortunate because we've actually enhance the identification system and we're working with a smaller number of players that were able to do it like that. And I, I think the other side is, and I should have mentioned this right at the beginning, is because I do lead the strategy across the country. It's just going and working with ambitious coaches in each rec center and growing them. So it's not just about building Jade as a person. We're actually building our Excel people to actually get the information and upskilling along the way because ultimately you know better coaches are going to equal better players and players receiving the right kind of information at the right time is probably the way we need to go so thanks annie um jay this is from uh, uh jacob lee but what what kind of advice would you give young players that are watching this webinar right now maybe even some of your old rex teammates about how they can grow their game like what is that, what's that nugget that you've learned um, to make it to the national team? Um, I would say there's two things. One thing kind of Julia touched on earlier is kind of the things you do behind the scenes. I think I'm a strong believer that that's ha what has gotten me to where I am today is definitely doing things when coaches aren't watching. 
um, I think that's helped me just because like it made me work harder, it made me have like an extra skill set that I, I didn't even know I had. Um, and I made sure that that was kind of something that I focused on at a very young age with my dad. Um, the second thing, actually, Danny touched on it quite a lot, um, which would be my biggest advice to any young player is that age does not matter. Um, he touched on it a lot, but it, it is true. And I hope that like Julia, Jordan and myself are kind of um, figures for young girls to kind of see that age doesn't matter. If you're young, okay, but if you're good enough, like you're good enough no matter the age. Um, and there's no restriction on that, so. Oh, I love that. So you've talked about that key being the work you do behind the scenes when no one's watching. So how have you stayed fit and motivated during COVID? Where have you been and how have you stayed sort of focused and uh, yeah, ready essentially? Yeah, so motivation has definitely been like a hard factor, definitely with quarantine. I feel like I can speak for everyone when I say that. Um, kind of like earlier how you have like sports med kind of always picking at you I mean we have like says and we have Sarah who are who are um our, our models there that kind of you know make sure that we're all in a good head space we're all in a good space physically um they send out a whole bunch of programs to make sure that we're touching on the certain things that we need to touch on and they're all tailored towards our specific um individual programs so for me like NCAA season hopefully if that starts back up again I have certain programs that are tailored toward that and I think that has helped me you know stay motivated to see that although there is a lot going on right now at the end of the day we're still striving towards a bigger picture and there's always Olympics in the back of my mind so I always want to stay ready and fit so that definitely has helped me stay motivated during this time. Oh, thanks thanks Jade you talked about the Olympics being postponed You've talked about uh, COVID. A lot of the questions that have come up in, from the audience have been really for you, Danny. And that is, we've talked about this pathway, acceleration, Rex, but COVID happened and, you know, you try and plan, but the pandemic maybe caught us all a bit uh, by surprise. How has it affected things? Like, what are we doing uh, in Canadian uh, Canada soccer to sort of handle this and work with it, with our pathway? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I've seen those questions too. Uh, a couple of things. I think when, when COVID first hit, people didn't really know how to respond. And I think when you look at the programs, I'm going to give a big credit to the, to the staff leads and the, the staff members that they really took care of the players. You know, they connected them online. They had Zoom meetings. We had some technical calls, tactical calls. We had some social emotional fun game calls. And, and so I just really want to give credit to, to those people that did that. And I think as, as it's kind of carried on, uh, things may look different, may look different in this pathway, September moving forward. Um, I know in the next couple of weeks, we internally are looking at the strategies of how to return to play, how to return to train. Um, and Ed Office are doing some great work there. Kenneth's working with a group of people that are, that are bringing out documents of best practice of how to come and return to train and play. I don't know what that looks like, um, but I, what I will say is that we're fully committed across the country to working with provincial partners on their return. And then in the pathway of identification, it's just promoting like windows of opportunity, more players for longer, just different ways to communicate with clubs, uh, high performance leagues, provincial systems leading to our Excel program. So a lot of work going on behind the scenes, uh, but most importantly, it's about staying safe at the minute and, and trying to do the right thing for us as a country and, and really for the game so we can prosper when we get to open up. Well, thanks, Danny. Um, I know we've we've gone a bit long today, but I really want to thank Julia and Jade uh, for joining us. Uh, Danny, Brandon, you know, all systems, every system um, all over Canada, all over the world has improvement areas. Um, and I know as an organization, we've been working really hard during COVID in order to make our game as accessible and attainable for as many as possible. 
And I feel as someone who's come through the system and now I work in it, that the net underneath our system has never been bigger um, and catching more players. So there was a lot of luck involved. There's still always going to be luck, but our pathway and our systems have really never looked more, um, more healthy. And I'm proud of what I'm a part of and what you've created, Danny. So I really appreciate everyone sticking with us and hearing about it. It's really easy to poke holes. Um, but the reality is this is player first and it's what you've, you've uh, said a couple times, Brandon and Danny, it's, it's people first and trying to make this as accessible as possible to as many as possible. To everyone online, I'd really like to um, let you know that on June 17th, we have our next webinar where we are going to be interviewing that four corner staff. So we've talked about it before and people have asked questions about it. There's the technical tactical, but then there's the rest of the player. So there's the medical, the sports science, the cultural, the mental, and we'll be talking to um, our sports scientists as well as the mental and medical leads on the, on June 17th. They are top experts in their field and we'll be asking them what they do day to day in order to make sure that our players for Canada are at the very top of their game. I'd also like to mention that today is wallpaper Wednesday for Canada soccer. So every Wednesday, uh, a men's player and a women's player is highlighted. So today is Diana Matheson. So I'm not sure she's big enough for the full wall wallpaper, but you might be able to get a little tile in there of her. She's not online, so it's just a jab for for her for later. Um, and tomorrow is Throwback Thursday. And actually, Jade, they are going to be highlighting you scoring your first goal against St. Kitts, which was also the game that uh, Christine broke her record. So your record was a little bit overshadowed. Can you tell us just, just to, before we finish, can you tell us what it was like scoring that goal for Canada? Yeah, no. Um... It was amazing. Um, it was exciting when I scored. I just remember like turning around next thing you know, I was like picked up in the air. And then I had a whole bunch of people tapping me on the head and everything. And it was really cool. And I, like you said, Christine Sinclair, she broke her record and I wouldn't take away that day from her at all. And I, I'm really honored to be able to share that with her and share that moment, you know, be able to celebrate my goal and her many, many goals with her. <laughs> Awesome. I love that. I think Canada soccer players need to work on their celebrations as they tap you on the head. Um, we hope you, uh, those listening and your loved ones continue to stay safe and healthy. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time. Thank you again. Bye.